Okay, I'm going to do a quick update on CPI, PPI, and the Fed meeting. Uh, we had the summary of economic projections. We'll look at that. But uh, just a quick announcement uh, for the applied level. I had said that uh, starting July 1st, you'd be able to, if you uh, had any of these three conditions, you would be able uh, to purchase the applied series at the $320 price, which our CFA candidates can purchase uh, instead of $440. Well, IT <clears throat> has impressed me. It's early. Uh, it will be available Friday, June 14th uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you won't have to worry about customer service anymore. You can just click on the option available on the, uh, on the website. The uh, link is in the description box below, and off you go. So the 320, just to, to repeat here, the 320 option instead of 440 is open to anybody who can demonstrate that they are, in fact, a CFA charter holder. Uh, any CFA candidate currently registered for an exam, previously you had to be registered uh, uh, or subscribed to our, uh, um, uh, our service to get this. We're opening up to any CFA candidate registered for an exam or that was registered for an exam up to 60 days ago. You're probably saying, well, 60 days, what's this? Let's say that you were registered to write level one in May of 2024. Well, you're in that little gray zone where you are not currently registered for an exam, but you currently do not have any results. So you wouldn't be able to upload any documents to demonstrate your status. You're in that little gray zone. So we will take any uh, exam registration from the past. You don't have to be currently registered. That was up to 60 days ago. That always will cover the last exam window. No matter where you are, it'll cover the last exam window. So you're currently registered for an exam or you uh, uh, were registered for the May exam or you have at least CFA level one standing. Uh, yes, documentation will be required. Uh, so you'll be paying 320 US instead of 440 US. Keep in mind some important dates, right? July 31st is the deadline for the all included subscription. Um, currently, if you subscribe at 440, you, you get you get everything that I'll be doing in the applied level from here on out. However, there will be some modules that are added on that will have a recurring fee. Um, if you don't uh, subscribe by July 31st, you don't get those. If you do subscribe by July 31st, they're automatically included. From August 1st onwards, uh, the applied level will have the same pricing. If you have CFA status, you'll pay 320. Non-CFA status, you'll pay 440. But uh, there will be a recurring monthly fee for selected modules. So anything I add into the applied level, you will continue to get. For example, the next sub-industry, I put this vote up on uh, LinkedIn, and it came in heavily in favor of ocean shipping. I gave everybody a choice. It was railroads, uh, ocean shipping, uh, or uh, trucking, and by far ocean shipping. So we'll do ocean shipping, which encompasses dry bulk shippers, wet shippers. This is a, a, a both a dirty and clean crude and container shipping. There are three types of ocean shipping that we'll look at. Uh, you keep getting these. You'll keep getting these, but you won't get the recurring modules. The first one is new positions. Uh, here I will list my new positions every single week, and I'll give you the whole thesis of why I'm taking it. <clears throat> and I'm currently doing that in the market outlook just so you can see a little bit of what it looks like. If you want to see what that looks like, go to last Sunday's market outlook. I did an extended one on MicroStrategy. Um, beginning September 24th, I'll be putting up new positions. So they'll be on the market outlook all the way to the end of August. August 25th will be the last day that it will be uh, public and free. And then after that, it goes into the applied level. If you are a subscriber, I, I keep wanting to repeat this because I know that somebody on August 1st will say, well, I thought if you are a subscriber by July 31st, you automatically get these. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, this is $50 a month. Um, that's what the uh, recurring uh, fees will be. And then same with peer groups. This is upcoming. Uh, I wouldn't be looking for this for about another 12 to 24 months because I have to get analysts to get that done. But they are uh, coming up. Uh, 50 a month, that's 600 a year, right? So if you uh, are in by July 31st, you automatically get that. Uh, August 1st, uh, your CFA status, you pay 320 and then it would be another $50 a month. So think of, uh, you know, you can think about it that way of, 
uh, uh, how inexpensive it is considering what you would be getting. And same with these, the peer groups, they would have a recurring fee. Now, I will say this. <clears throat> We've tried our best code for all of these contingencies. You're a charter holder, good. You're a current candidate, we got you. You were registered, we got you. You have at least CFA level one standing, we got you. Um, but we're not sure if our code handles everything. For example, I said, well, what if somebody has CFA level standing and they did it in 2002? Uh, and they can demonstrate that they have CFA level one standing, but the document they upload is a different document than our system can read. Well, then there'd be an error, right? We wouldn't, we, our system hadn't seen one from 2002. We wouldn't be able to read it. We wouldn't recognize it. It would be an error. The coding may not cover all contingencies, okay? So if, if you satisfy one of these conditions and the document upload is not working for you, just contact support at markmeldern.com and uh, this way here we'll see uh, or IT will see what exception is not being handled and they'll be able to code for it so that we can uh, we can eliminate that from happening okay let's have a look at CPI PPI and the Fed I have uh, been waiting for a couple hours to do this video because it, it's uh, raining here and there's thunder in the background and it keeps, uh, my mic keeps picking it up, but it's not letting up, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Um, this is sort of a midweek update. A lot of things happened this week. Uh, big things, uh, CPI, PPI, and the Fed, which uh, kind of changes a few things. So let's have a look at what we had. Uh, we had the uh, summary of economic projections, which I have up on the screen. Uh, change in real GDP from the March projection. Uh, no change in this one at all. So they're not showing any extra uh, upside to GDP. Unemployment rate ticking up. Not in 2024, but uh, in 2025, projecting it to be 4.2 instead of 4.1. 2026, 4.1 instead of 4. Settling out to 4.2 instead of 4.1. Call that constant, really. I mean, uh, 0.1 up and down. Uh, we can basically call that unchanged. This is where it gets a little bit interesting. Uh, their forecast for PCE inflation this year, uh, 0.2 higher than the March projection uh, in 2025, 0.1 higher before uh, settling down to the 2% in 2026. And the core also 0.2 higher, 0.1 higher before settling down. So the distribution of rate cuts, 1 for 2024 versus 3, uh, in 2025, 4 versus 3. In 2026, 4 versus 3. Uh, and then uh, to get the long-term rate, one more cut instead of two. So uh, 10 cuts altogether um, into, to get to the longer run versus 11. I, um, I want to remind you all uh, that if you go back to the very beginning, the end of 2022, before the Fed really started to recognize that it needed to raise rates. And look at the summary of economic projections each and every time uh, that it was given. And then look at what happened. The Fed has a 100% track record of being wrong. 100% track record of being wrong in what they think is the likely path of everything. The likely path of unemployment, the likely path of PCE, the likely path of core, and the likely path of the Fed funds rate, they have been 100% wrong. So when we uh, look at what is going on here, I'm going to side with probabilities and say that they are probably going to be 100% wrong. There is lots of evidence showing that uh, inflation uh, especially at the core and especially at super core is coming down in fact month over month super core was negative showing deflation that is um, uh, um, everything less food less energy and less shelter uh, i'll show you uh, where that number is and i'll also show you where uh, certain numbers are expected to decline significantly year over year due to base effects uh, but, again, keep in mind, a 100% track record uh, of being wrong. I think inflation uh, uh, heads down much faster than what the Fed thinks. I think we had a supply issue, plain and simple. We had a supply issue that kind of got a little bit sticky for a while. But, as I've said many, many times, 
Uh, we live in a more and more technologically driven world and technology is deflationary. If we want to look for the source of future inflation, it's government. Uh, we had an opportunity to really lower the cost of vehicles in North America. Uh, a BYD vehicle uh, with the new battery technology, uh, something like 2,000 kilometers on a charge, uh, 13,500. The U.S. said, well, let's throw a 100% tariff on that. Let's make sure that some other country's technology doesn't lower our costs. Uh, doing it in the name of protectionism, protecting our industries, calling it dumping from Chinese firms. Uh, but still, you have a government saying prices are too high, while at the same time stopping the very thing coming into the country that would, in fact, lower the prices. Okay, let's look at CPI. And uh, I've um, calculated some of the numbers uh, to more than just one decimal place. All items said zero. It's actually 0.005%. Call it zero. It's as close to zero as, as you're going to get. I highlighted all the negative numbers as well in uh, yellow, quite a few of them. All items less food and energy, 0.2. If you calculate it out to more than one decimal place, you get to 0.15, a bigger drop than just the 0.2. This was, uh, the month before was 0.34 something, all the way to 0.15. That is not just a 0.1 drop, that is a 0.2 drop. Super core, negative 0.04. The super core is now in deflation. Uh, I don't know why that didn't get more, more attention. I mean, 0.04%. That's 0 0.0004. Um, call it zero, but still, you got a little negative sign in front of there on the SuperCorp. Uh, apparel down 0.3. Uh, new vehicles down 0.5. Uh, this is odd. Uh, used cars and trucks 0.6. Manaheim used car index uh, was much lower than that. So this is probably something to do with base effects. Uh, rent of primary residence, 0.39, they have it as 0.4, close enough, and owner's equivalent rent, 0.433 from 0.4. It was basically the same thing the month before, coming in at 0.433. Transportation services, negative. The big one that was positive for the longest time, motor vehicle insurance, negative 0.1. Airfares, negative 3.6, that is a big drop down. Let's go all the way to page 36. This is where we get the special indexes. If you have the applied level, you've been through the uh, CPI video, you know where everything is, you know how to read these things. Services, less rent of shelter. Month over month was 0.021%, not a 0.2, not a 0.1, we call it almost zero, 0 0.021, services, less rent of shelter. Um, year over year, 5%. That is the largest increase year over year since April of 2023 when it was 5.2. So you think, well, what's going on here? Look at all these. Uh, the year over year, uh, it, the S means it is the smallest increase, smallest increase since February. Uh, this one, smallest increase since March of 2021. All items list food, shelter, and energy. Smallest uh, increase year over year, 1.9. That's super core, 1.9 percent year over year the smallest since March of 2021 you got to go back that far when it was 1.6 look at all the S's everything is S except here the largest and uh, services less rent to shelter month over month was almost non-existent so what's going on here uh, we'll look at some numbers and you will see that it is this is nothing more this five percent is is nothing more than a base effect if we look at the month over month it's there hardly was any change. It's the year over year, but we'll look out into August, September, October, and you'll see that this will start showing some of the smallest increases year over year. Services, less rent of shelter. The super core uh, is, with the base effects coming up, is set to drop significantly. Okay, I have the adjusted indexes up. This is services, less rent of shelter. Uh, in uh, the U.S. cities, uh, all urban consumers seasonally adjusted. Here we are, 415.656 for May. This was the month before April, 415.568. It is up a little bit, but as I said, it's like 0.02%. Uh, and if you just move up, it's the year over year. Look at last April, 396, and then going into May, it dropped to 395. So last year, 
drop down going into May, and this year was kind of small move up. So it's base effect. You look at the next month, 396, 97, 99, 401. Once you get into August, the 97 to 99, that is a big jump. So if we start to have small increases from here on in, by the time you start getting into July, August, the base effects year over year will start showing some of the lowest. 399 jumps to 401, to 402, 404, 406. Uh, so there again, second half of the year, the super core, uh, the base effects, uh, since last year it did this, and this year if it does this, you know, goes sideways, look at what happens to those base effects year over year. They wear off that by the time you get to September, October, you'll be seeing it less than 2% year over year, probably a couple months in a row. If the Fed is looking for uh, uh, definitive evidence uh, or conclusive evidence that inflation is uh, on its way to 2%, it is there. Uh, I mean, really, it is there. You just got to get rid of these base effects. Uh, it should really start having an August, September. By the time you get to the September meeting, if, they don't, if, if they're still not cutting at the September meeting, uh, then they're going to err uh, uh, significantly. You, you can look at another uh, mistake. They were late to start hiking. They'll be late to start cutting. Okay, let's look at PPI. We'll start with final demand before we go through uh, input costs for stage one to stage four. So what is final demand? Um, think about uh, CPI. This is the price consumers pay for stuff. PPI just looks at it from the other end of the transaction. This is the prices uh, producers receive from consumers, final demand. So uh, CPI measures what goes out of the consumer's pocket. So if there's an increase in sales tax, that increases CPI because that leaves the consumer's pocket. But it does not enter the producer's cash register because that tax goes to the government. So there would be no increase in PPI because of that. So there are differences between CPI and PPI. This is what uh, the retailers and the service providers receive from the uh, consumers. I've broken it down here into final demand goods and final demand services. We can see the weighting here. Final demand goods is 30% of the index. Final demand services is 67% of the index. Uh, overall final demand dropped. Uh, it's negative 0.2. Uh, demand for goods, negative 0.8. Look at all the negative signs in here. You got a negative sign here, negative, negative. Look at them all. I didn't highlight them all because uh, just the way that this document works, sometimes you, you just can't highlight in there. There we go. I got that. Uh, and then when you get to final demand services, flat. Uh, and then, uh, again, look at the negative numbers that you have in here. You can just scan down and see all the negative uh, all in and these are big ones 4.2, 4.2, 4.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Look at that, lots of negative numbers. So, that is what they're receiving based on final demand. Let's move up. By the way, um, the numbers that we saw for CPI and PPI, if you uh, watched the market outlook on Sunday, I talked about um, PMI services and uh, PMI manufacturing prices paid the index. Uh, for the month of May, prices paid went down on both of them. Uh, and I said that for services, prices paid uh, is a better indicator of where CPI would be. And uh, for manufacturing, prices paid is a better indicator of uh, where PPI would be. And CPI came in in line with the PMIs, with prices paid, and so did PPI. This is stage four, stage three, stage two, stage one. This now is what they paid. So final demand, imagine all the outlets that sell to consumers. What we just saw was the, was the uh, prices they received. That's their stage four. So the stuff they sell is what we just looked at. This is for the stuff they buy. This is stage four input costs. Uh, so for May, total negative, uh, it's, a, it's a, not a, a chart, so I can't highlight it. Negative 0.2, goods inputs, negative 0.4 services inputs zero stage three supply stage four so what did uh, so you could look at stage four saying well those are your input costs that must be stage three selling prices stage three's input costs negative 0.7 goods negative 1.8 services 0.3 going back to stage two which supply stage three their input costs for total is negative 0.8 Goods, negative 2.4, services 0.3. 
And then stage one, supply stage two. What did stage one pay on goods, or sorry, total negative 0.8 on goods, negative 1.6, services zero. So zero here would feed through to here, or they'll have some markup here on their services. It's 0.3, uh, which was also 0.3 going into stage three. So it doesn't look like much of a markup here. And then uh, going into stage four, it disappears. So it looks like stage four is being aggressive with their stage three supplier saying, well, you can't keep passing on these costs to us. Um, so uh, overall, that's how we would read stage one, two, three, four. Stage one is the very early uh, uh, part of the process where this is their input costs. They then process that, sell it to stage two. This is their input costs, which then process that, that sell it to stage three. Their input. Look at all those negative signs. Look at all those negative signs. Okay, let's see what kind of effect that had. Here's S&P 500, the SPX, uh, 54.33.74 as of the close of uh, Thursday, June 13th. This is after the Fed day, which was June 12th, and PPI in the morning of the 13th, 54.33. Uh, this week, we printed another record closing on SPX up 1.68% in the past five days. Uh, look at the month, up 4.07%. Want to have a look at year to date on this thing, 14.57%. That's incredible. Let's have a look at TLT. That is the other part of our 60-40 portfolio if we're going to run that, right? SPY for 60%, TLT for 40%, and we don't have to worry about paying sponsor fees, no management fees, just at the level of the ETF. 93.88 uh, closed for the day. Uh, five days, up 2.26%, outperformed the SPX uh, for the week. If we look at year to date, not too impressive. Now in 4.51%, S&P outperformed it by 20%. I think it might be getting a little ahead of itself. If, we, uh, if I see 95, 96, I might think about selling calls on positions I have, but uh, not now. I think uh, over the next 12 months, duration is a winner. Uh, I think the Fed uh, is underestimating the speed at which inflation is going to come down. I think they're overestimating the power of demand uh, and un underestimating the power of technology to reduce costs. Not only that, there seems to be a lot of focus on uh, job gains and uh, potential wage pressure because of job gains. But keep in mind, if you, have, if you hire someone, you produce more output, you create more supply. Why would you hire someone if it produces no extra output, right? No, you wouldn't do that. Uh, so all these job gains are increasing supply in the market. So you can say, well, increased, uh, you have increased aggregate demand because you have more people working, but those people who are working are producing more outputs. You have more aggregate supply combined with technology. Uh, I, I see us going back into a world of surplus, not a world of deficit. I see a repeat of what we had throughout the 2010 to 2020 period where, yes, the Fed put a lot of money out in the market, increased its balance sheet, and inflation was nowhere to be seen. Where, oh, where, oh, where was inflation? It wasn't anywhere. We shut down the global economy. We reopened it up, and surprise, surprise, we have inflation. But that wasn't because of demand. It just was a general lack of supply. I think, I think that's behind us. And I think as we move forward, the Fed is going to have to run very quickly, I think, to keep up with the pace at which inflation starts falling. I wouldn't be surprised if by this time next year, the Fed is talking about the specter of deflation. Uh, and uh, as much as you keep hearing that we're not going back to the levels pre-pandemic, in a technologically driven world uh, with diminishing costs to scale uh, in, in a lot of different uh, areas in the market. Uh, I don't see how the Fed can uh, uh, keep, uh, keep rates elevated without, without seeing deflation. They're going to have to uh, go back to the zero line. Uh, that is, that is uh, I, what I've always believed. I still believe they're going to go after, back to the zero line. They may not see it yet, but I still think that technology wins the day on this one and that we are actually going to go back to where we were before, which is where, oh, where is inflation? Um, that's it. I just thought uh, a nice midweek update 
uh, because we did have, I, I think, uh, some significant reports. And uh, oh, one more thing, yeah, the uh, Fed uh, press conference. I started making my notes on this one, and I was bored to tears because every question I kept thinking, oh, come on, man. Can we get a collection of more uninteresting questions than we had this Wednesday? These questions were so uninteresting um, that, that, you know, there was nothing there. Uh, some of them I had to listen to a couple of times because I couldn't figure out what the question was. Uh, and when you listen to the answer, you say, well, I'll listen to the answer. Maybe Powell understood the question and I'll figure out what the question is from the answer. Uh, I couldn't do it either. So I listened again. I, I don't even know what you're I don't even know what you're asking here. Your question set up everything you said. Well, given that we're seeing this and that we're seeing this, uh, here's this question in two parts. And I'm thinking, like, how is the setup got anything to do with your question? I, you know, I don't know. He, he didn't push back enough saying, I don't understand your question. <laughs> Well, what are you asking? Use different words, please. Anyways, uh, I didn't bother doing a video for that because I got about halfway through and I thought, I got nothing to say here other than repeat what the questions were. Um, I can say this. It was an extremely uninteresting press conference. Nothing much got said. Nothing much got asked. Of all the interesting questions I could have asked, uh, they simply weren't asked. So you didn't miss much there.